Hey. Hi, Dr. Harden. How's it going? It's good. How are you? Good I'm to see you. Wonderful. Nice to see you as well. Um, so I'm, I'll, now that you've joined us, I'm going to welcome everyone once again. Again, my name is Steve Meisick. I'm a social media specialist at Rush. Today, I'm going to be talking with Dr. Abigail Harden, who is a rehabilitation psychologist at Rush and the author of the COVID Survival Guide. Dr. Harden, again, thanks for joining us. Hi. Um, to get things started, tell us a little bit why uh, you decided to write the book. Yeah. So, you know, during the beginning of the spring pandemic, we were seeing a lot of COVID survivors going into our rush rehabilitation units. And in fact, at one point in the spring pandemic, we actually were only seeing COVID patients. And, you know, as I was treating these patients and helping them get home to their families and trying to get them back to work and back to their jobs, it was becoming more and more clear to me that survival was really only the beginning of all of this and that there was going to be a very significant amount of long-term recovery um, post-COVID that, that folks were going to have to have to deal with. And so I realized looking around the, the country that there wasn't yet a good infrastructure for post-COVID clinics. There wasn't yet um, a rehabilitation psychologist in every hospital. And so I wanted to write something that people could take with them through this process, almost as if they had a rehabilitation psychologist in their pocket to take with them through the process. Um, and so that's, that's why I wrote the book, because I knew that um, it was so new and there were few resources out there for folks. Sure. And so what's the general structure of the book? What, do you, what, do you, uh, what are the main topics that you're discussing? Yeah. So the book talks a little bit at the beginning of just the basic stuff that I think we all know by now, how to protect yourself, the basic CDC recommendations. But then the rest of the book really focuses very much on what to expect if you do end up with COVID and if you do need to go to the hospital and then how to make the most out of your time in the hospital, how to get the best care, how to work with the physicians and the other team members you might be working with, and then how to approach the recovery after survival. You know, I, I use this phrase, survival is just the beginning, and it really is. You know, surviving COVID is really just the opening gate of this whole other marathon of recovery for a lot of folks. And so I walk people through how to approach that, what to expect in the different phases of rehabilitation, and how to approach some of the cognitive and emotional recovery that seems to go along with uh, COVID recovery. Gotcha. And so in the book, when you talk about what it's like to have COVID, does there seem to be different outcomes or symptoms for people who have to be hospitalized for COVID versus those who are able to recover at home? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. So, you know, the longer that we've been able to see survivors come through COVID, it's becoming clear that there are, in, in essence, two groups. There's folks who have had what we call severe COVID, meaning they had to be hospitalized and they maybe were, were in the ICU itself. And then there was there's this other group of folks who maybe weren't needing to go to the hospital and they had what we call mild COVID, you know, mild in the sense that they didn't need an ICU physician overseeing right. their care, quite serious. And they seem to be having different outcomes. You know, the folks who were in the hospital or in the ICU, a lot of them are experiencing a common syndrome associated with being in the ICU called post intensive care syndrome. And that is a syndrome that includes things like physical changes and weakness, um, difficulty with cognition or thinking skills, and emotional concerns like depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder. So we're seeing a lot of that with the folks coming out of the hospital. And then for the folks who fortunately didn't need to be hospitalized, they are also, though, still having some long-term effects. And those are the folks who I think are re referring to themselves now as long haulers, you know, not necessarily people who are in the hospital, but are still having very serious symptoms. Um, and so, yeah, there seems to be kind of two different groups in two different pictures. Gotcha. Um, so what are the symptoms of long COVID, if you will? Yeah. So, you know, I just talked a little bit about the, the people who are coming out of the hospital, post-intensive care syndrome. The, really, the three sy symptoms of that are physical body weakness. So that can be difficulty moving around, difficulty standing, even difficulty with small muscles like the swallowing muscles. Mm. It also can, can come along with cognitive changes like difficulty remembering, paying attention, delirium, being confused, and then emotional changes like PTSD, anxiety, depression. But then let's talk a little bit about the other people because there's, there's this long hauler group who, who don't have post-intensive care syndrome, but they're also reporting a good amount of uh, what they're calling brain fog, kind of this mm -hmm. sense that they're not 
quite moving as quickly as they were before cognitively, but also some emotional changes like depression or anxiety. They're also talking about um, what we call post-exertional fatigue. That's getting really, really tired very, very quickly. Just doing something simple like walking up a flight of stairs in your house or trying to take your dog out you know, to use the bathroom. Those kinds of things are exhausting people in a way that they weren't before. So those kinds of symptoms seem to be happening together. And that is very consistent with a, a type of disorder that we already knew about called chronic fatigue syndrome. Interesting. I didn't realize that those two um, had an overlap. That's, that's something new to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting because there, we have known about chronic fatigue syndrome for decades. It's something that we know can come along with post viral syndromes. And it seems to be, um, it seems to have a lot in common with what the long haulers are expressing. And of course, there's some uniqueness to COVID, especially with how much it affects the respiratory system. But the, the other symptoms, the, the cognitive fatigue, the physical fatigue, some pain, the depression, all of that seems to be very consistent. Syndrome. And so after someone does survive COVID, um, and you know, what is the recovery process typically like? Is it sort of, is it a gradually sort of decreasing thing? Or and, and how long does it usually take for those symptoms to start fading? Yeah. So after someone is in the hospital with COVID, the, the first step is to determine if it's safe to, to even go home. So if you're not able to do things like get bathroom or make yourself breakfast, right? Those are things that you have to be able to do in order to be able to be safe in your own house. So if you're not able to do those things because you have very profound weakness, then it would be appropriate to go to an inpatient rehabilitation floor, which is what a lot of these folks ended up doing. And that's how I came to see them. So that usually lasts for a couple of days to a couple of weeks where you're getting almost like boot camp therapies to get stronger to the point where you can be safe at home. But then the, the journey really doesn't end there. So even after you're discharged from the intensive rehabilitation program, you might have another several months of outpatient therapies or home health therapies. So we're talking about a period of time that can extend for weeks to months, not days for these folks who are in the ICU. Now, some, some get lucky and that's not necessary, um, but for quite a few folks, that's the timeline. Right. And so Rush recently launched its post-COVID care clinic, which you're involved with, um, for people who are still experiencing symptoms after being infected. Um, tell us a little bit how you're involved with that clinic exactly. Yeah, so I am just so excited about this post-COVID clinic. So there are, there are COVID clinics popping up all over the country um, because of the tremendous need and because these long haulers have been so such good advocates for themselves in trying to get their needs and that's appropriate. So what was really exciting about the Rush COVID clinic is that it is multidisciplinary. And what I mean by that is there are lots of different kinds of physicians, doctors, providers who are all coming together so that any given person, whether they were in the hospital or not, can get their whole body addressed. Um, so they've got a nephrologist, a pulmonologist, a cardiologist, basically any part of the body you can think of, they've got an expert in it. And that includes cognition and emotions, which is very, very cool because as we know in the US health healthcare system, there isn't always a strong focus on thinking and feelings. Those sometimes get left in the dust. So that's exciting. So my part of that is as the, as the psychologist on that team. So I meet with folks and I take their brain out for a little cognitive screen or a little mini test drive, if you will, um, to, to see how their brain is healing. Um, and then I also talk to people about the emotion COVID and how to start putting their lives back together in a way that is um, healthy and kind of taking it slow one day at a time, but also is going to get them towards their individual goal, whether that is going back to work or, you know, just kind of getting back into the swing of things with parenting, whatever that looks like. Right. And interestingly, to dovetail off that, what is, what are the risks of trying to recover from something like COVID without the help of a psychologist or paying attention to mental health? Yeah. I worry tremendously about this. Um, so I, there are certainly folks who can recover on their own and who won't need to see a psychologist. Maybe they have family support, maybe they've got other resources that they can use. But then again, I also have seen, um, you know, any kind of critical illness or any other kind of long-term symptoms that are not addressed can really derail people. For instance, I've seen 
folks um, never really get their cognition tested, but start to feel right. fuzzy or to feel foggy. And as a result, they start making errors at work and maybe they get let go um, because they didn't have the knowledge of what was going on in the brain and how to compensate it, compensate for it so that they could be successful going back to work. I've also seen marriages fall apart. I've seen, mm. you know, people with depression and really not be able to get themselves out of it. And all of these things, it can affect families right now, but it can affect families for generations. You know, these kinds of serious illnesses can really derail communities, families. And so, you know, I think my my message that I repeat a lot is, is that, you know, if you're having emotional concerns or cognitive concerns, you know, the head is connected to the body. It's part of your body. So if that's part of what you're feeling, then that needs to be addressed too. And I'm, so I'm so glad that the Rush COVID clinic is is including that because it is so important. And so when would someone consider going to a clinic like this? Like what would be the threshold that they would want to do this versus um, maybe just seeing a psychologist on top of recovering at home? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, if you have access to a psychologist, like let's say you were already hooked up with a therapist um, and you've got a really good relationship with that person and you trust them, then you can certainly bring your post COVID concerns to them as well. And that might be a great place to, to start with that. Um, you know, I always think about this in terms of function. So the questions I ask are, have you had any trouble getting back to work? Are you having any trouble in your relationship? Is this affecting you in a way that it's making it difficult for you to do the things that you want to do? And if any of those are the case, then it is a good time to go get seen in a clinic. Gotcha. Um, so now we're going to move on to a couple of the frequently asked questions that you've received a combination with uh, some of the questions we received through Instagram. Thank you by the way, to everyone who uh, submitted those. Um, so first, COVID's very new, but is there any research on past viruses that can help us help COVID survivors understand what they're going through? Yeah, I talked a little bit earlier about post-intensive care syndrome and chronic fatigue syndrome. So those, those syndromes are really, really useful to us now in understanding COVID because they've actually, we've known about them for a very long time. So chronic fatigue syndrome is one that, that is really fascinating. And chronic fatigue syndromes tends to show up after some types of viral infections, um, just things as simple as the flu can cause it for some folks. And it seems to just dysregulate the body in such a way that people have long-term effects. And I think that's a kind of exactly what we're seeing with COVID. So on the one hand, I think survivors of COVID are really unique. But on the other hand, we're not really starting from zero here. We actually have lots and lots of literature on how to treat um, chronic fatigue syndrome. We have some initial evidence about what works and what doesn't work. Um, and so that's kind of where we're starting. So these clinics have some, you know, some background literature that they're leaning on. Um, and then with the folks coming out of the hospital with post-intensive care syndrome, that's one that is just very clearly reflected in the literature. It's something that we saw after SARS in the early 2000s. It's mm -hmm. something we see with severe flu. You know, we see post-intensive uh, post care syndrome really with any kind of um, serious illness that will bring someone to the ICU. So both of those are really helping inform all of the research and all of the treatments that are being provided now within the COVID clinic. Gotcha. And when someone's recovering from COVID, are there any things that people can do to sort of like mitigate the symptoms that they're experiencing? I know, you know, we talked about understanding them is a big thing, but you know, people talking about the loss of smell or the brain fog or the body aches. Is there anything that people can do to sort of help cope with that? Yeah. Well, so to start with, there's some, there's a few things that they can do actually while they're even still in the hospital to help mitigate some mm -hmm. of them. Um, those can be really simple things like um, making sure that you've got your glasses and your hearing aids, um, making sure that you are staying on the phone and FaceTiming with family from family members and friends so that you're really um, getting support and staying grounded through the process. Then after survival, um, yeah, there's there's quite a few things that, that we can do for the kind of chronic fatigue syndrome slash long COVID that people are experiencing. One of them is... Um, a process called pacing in which people start low and slow, but kind of commit to doing a certain amount of activity per day, as long as they're cleared by their physician. Mm -hmm. One of the, one of the traps of <clears throat> peak syndrome is um, almost having a, a great day and then overdoing it and then falling into the trap of doing nothing the next day. And so you end up with mm -hmm. these waves of activity and pacing right. tries to help 
help the patient start to do the same amount of activity a day and then slowly increase that over time. So there aren't as many ups and downs in, in their activity. And that seems to really help with um, increasing your tolerance for exercise. And it also seems to help with clearing up the cognitive fog. Great. I'm so glad to hear that there are things because I think there's, there's a lot of concern that, you know, people are just going to experience this and there's really not a lot you can do. Um, yeah. So, and for someone who isn't experiencing COVID, but maybe has a family member, if even if they can't go to the hospital, what can they do to help someone who has COVID or is recovering from COVID? Yeah. Yeah. So I mentioned a little bit before that when someone's in the hospital, there's actually some things that you can do that are helpful. Um, one of the things that family members can do is to call regularly or to get on some kind of video chat and mm -hmm. to check with the loved one while, while they're in the hospital. That, that, that does two things. It, one, makes sure that they feel supported and cared for during this extremely scary time. And two, it can also help people literally ground themselves in reality. And what I mean by mm -hmm. that is keeping track of who they are, where they are, what's going on. Because this virus can cause um, pretty serious inflammation in the brain that can make people feel very confused, very um, disoriented. It can even make them hallucinate. And by getting that grounding re regularly from somebody who you trust and you um, you love, that can actually really help limit how severe that disorientation gets, which makes the ultimate recovery a lot better. The right. other thing I always recommend is if you have young kids and someone's in the hospital with COVID, of course the kids can't come to the hospital, but keep them involved. They can actually um, feel very helpless if they don't have mm. something to do to Tribute. And so it can be really helpful to ask them to make posters, make cards, sing a song over video chat, just give them something to do to, to help them feel like they're helping through the situation. Yeah, that's, that's, that's great advice. Um, well, we actually have to wrap it up. So thank you so much, Dr. Harden, for taking the time to chat with us. Um, where can people find your book? Um, so the COVID survival guide? Yeah, it's on Amazon. Wonderful. And you can do it uh, as a digital and a physical book? Yep, you can choose. There's a Kindle version and there is a hard copy version. Awesome. Well, I'm sure, I hope people uh, get to ch check out your book. It's wonderful and it's been providing great guidance to a lot of people. And I want to thank everyone for tuning in. This has been a wonderful first experiment with Instagram Live for Rush. Um, please stay tuned or go to rush.edu if you have any more questions about the vaccine, about COVID. Again, thank you, Dr. Harden, for joining us. And thanks everyone for joining us. Have a great rest of your day. Take care.